want to begin by thanking Peter and all of the Aspen Institute staff, Chloe and Katie and Abby and everybody. They've been absolutely amazing. And I mean, I don't think I could have ever felt more welcomed, more uh, coddled, <laughs> more taken care of, um, more assisted. I want to thank all of you participants, too, because it's very rare when you get people who come to something and they really stick with it for three days. You know, uh, the only other thing that I can think of is probably Woodstock Nation that lasted that long and that people kind of <laughs> stuck it out, but they were in the mud, you know. And, <laughs> um, and everybody here has just really been amazing. We've had wonderful conversations with all of you. I look forward to a little bit more of that before we all disperse. So thank you very much uh, for being here, all of the, all of the participants. And so what I want to do is just start by thinking about everything we've done and heard, which is going to be difficult. And so I'm going to suggest that we have to think about it kind of like a time lapse movie. Or think about, um, we're supposed to talk about what did the 19th century West, what, what can thinking with the 19th century West tell us about the challenges that face us today. Um, so what if we think about it as a time lapse movie? And that's something that goes real fast. So we see people and goods flowing in and out across oceans and prairies and mountains, uh, moving up out, uh, material moving up out of the earth and across borders, north, south, east, and west, a remarkable dynamism, a remarkable diversity of people. It is not Thomas Jefferson's settled agrarian uh, utopia. It's not that. It's not a place where people go and they stick and they're just dispersed across the landscape and they're just there for a while. People are moving around and they are a hundred times more diverse and a hundred times more mobile than Jefferson could ever have imagined, uh, in part because of the railroad, as Terry said. Uh, there are endless encounters among strangers and friends. Many of them are cordial and productive and even joyous. Many are also violent, inhumane, devastating, but most of them are mixed. Trading and trapping and mining, farming and the founding and the maintaining and the growth of cities and towns. So this is an incredibly dynamic picture of people and things mobilizing and transforming. And that can tell us something about the world we live in today, I think. We have two speakers who are distinguished scholars. They direct important regional study centers at two of the most important research universities in the nation's most diverse and most dynamic state. So I want to ask them, uh, what do they think about this picture of the 19th century American West? And given their areas of expertise, culture and politics and history, um, how can we think with this dynamic 19th century American West and moments of intervention in that history that will help us think about the challenge of the future? And I'd like to start with Bruce. Well, thank you very much. Um, just. Uh, say a little bit about myself. I'm a political scientist, and I happen to direct a center that was founded by two historians, one who was a 19th century historian, uh, Richard White, and the other who was a 20th century historian, uh, David Kennedy. And so our center does a lot of thinking about the relationship between uh, earlier periods in history in the West and contemporary West. And we teach a class where uh, we have five different instructors, one from art history, one from literature, one from hydrology, political scientist and historian, where we spend a lot of time thinking about these kinds of themes. And as I listened, I learned a lot today uh, and over the last three days from uh, many of the presenters. Uh, and I wanna build off of some of these themes because, uh, and I've jotted down three, I could have easily jotted down 20. <laughs> so let me just do these three themes very quickly. One that I think came up uh, quite frequently and today was, uh, again discussed is this whole question of the assumption that we could engineer our way to abundance in an area of scarcity, which is essentially what we thought we could do in the 19th century, and we did do successfully, as many people pointed out in the earlier panels. But that assumption was flawed in many ways at the time, but is particularly flawed now in the 20th century because of climate change. Uh, whether you believe it's man-made or Otherwise, we're definitely in a cycle where um, the issue of water scarcity, as Sarah was talking about in her two panel discussions, has become very prominent. Sarah talked about immigration, but uh, uh, irrigation rather, but behind the irrigation is an assumption in the 19th century about the way we would get water from where it was abundant to where it's scarce. And so that basic system was that the, the, the mountains were a refrigerator, 
that would accumulate moisture during the winter and store it up there for us. And then it would release it because in many areas of the West, particularly the semi-arid uh, er arid areas of the West, we have our, uh, virtually no rain during the summer months. And it would release that water conveniently in the spring and the summer. It would be stored in the reservoirs and we would utilize it. The problem with climate change is that with temperatures increasing, the snowpack is diminishing, and you're getting rains that immediately come down the mountains during the winter when we don't normally need the water. And that means that we've got to find storage capacity either through aquifers or more reservoirs or dams or whatever in order to capture that because it's not going to stay up there as snow. So that's an example of where we made an assumption. It worked, but it was very much determined by the particular circumstances of the climate, uh, including, uh, as was mentioned by Dan earlier, that the early part of the 19th century was unusually wet, and so there was an assumption that there was abundance when there wasn't. The second, I think, that came across just listening to the history talks is the very strong assumption that the West was there to be utilized, to be managed, to be, uh, you know, to have timber cut down, to have uh, agriculture, uh, to, to uh, produce economic resources. And it's still very much an assumption of the discussion that we had today. It doesn't go away. Um, but as today's panels talked about, the last part of the 19th century is really the beginning of the conservation movement. And if you go into the 20th century, you get even one step further, right, which is the wilderness concept, the preservationist, that you should have areas that don't even have recreational uses, are not necessarily there to be viewed like a museum, uh, but should be preserved as wildlife. And so that continuum, which really develops throughout the 19th century, you can see that playing out in uh, the uh, sort of mixed um, mandates that uh, the public land system has, both within agencies and across the agencies. The most utilitarian agency being, of course, uh, the Bureau of Land Management and then the wilderness, uh, uh, people that manage the wilderness have the most preservationist and many of the other agencies are somewhere caught in the conservation medium. Um, Sarah might be able to explain, explain that more, but that's basically where we are today. And so let's think about two things that we've been talking about, but we haven't really gone into any, de any detail, and that is Bears Ears. Okay, Bears Ears is really about that balancing between these different impulses we have between conservation, preservation, and utilization. And what has happened, of course, was that President Obama went ahead and did what is a pattern that I could go on and on about, which is the pattern of impatience in the face of division, partisan division. And so what happens is that uh, th executive actions are nothing new, uh, but they have been expanded in their powers over time as we've had more stalemate due to partisan divisions. And so Obama went ahead and interpreted the Antiquities Act in a fairly aggressive manner. Uh, and went ahead and declared this area to be a national monument area using the Antiquities Act. That makes a lot of sense for people who are pro-environmental and understand that the frustration that Congress was never going to do it, then the president has to do it. But you live by the sword and you die by the sword. And if you're going to do something with an executive action, it can be undone by an executive action. So it should not have surprised anyone, whether it was going to be Trump or whether it was going to be any of the other Republican candidates, that they were going to do something about that. And they, through Congressional Review Act and a variety of other things that we just don't have time to talk about, there were a lot of things that were undone, including DACA, but it was really in the cards because it was controversial to create Bears Ears that there would be some movement back. And that's essentially what the Trump administration did. It cut the size of the land, right? And now there's some discussion of whether to sell it. The other one is on the fracking, right? The fracking is, has in, and here it's really hard for the environmental movement because fracking has actually helped the climate change picture. Because the more we can substitute gas for coal, the better off we are in terms of reducing emissions and doing something about climate change. But the fracking, that, that, that expansion of the use of gas was made possible by a technology which had existed but not really been widely used which allows people to drill in vertical ways and then to frack the rock to take out the gas and oil that's there through 
basically explosions and chemicals, et cetera. And if that's not done properly, if it isn't far enough below the, the water table, and if it isn't uh, the right kind of rock on top of it, it can get into the water table. So it, it raises tremendous environmental concerns. So lastly, I'll, there's one thing I'll mention that hasn't come up because you waited for the last panel to put a political scientist on, <laughs> <clears throat> is populism. Populism, both as a political movement as studied by historians, but populism more generically in terms of the belief in the individual, the autonomy of the individual, the self-reliance ethic, the notion that individual citizens can make better decisions than representatives can make. And populism is heavily, or was heavily concentrated in the West and Midwest, and it gave rise to institutions like 19th century constitutions, which are completely different from the 18th century constitution that we have in the federal government. The 19th century constitution is basically a grab bag of everybody's wishes. So this kind of distinction between the rules of the game and actual policy completely breaks down in the 19th century. And we insert everything from the right to fish to uh, insurance laws, et cetera, all go into our constitution. But the most important thing that came out of that was direct democracy. And direct democracy gave us the referendum where you can overturn a bill that's passed by the, the legislature. It gave us the recall where you can get people out of office and not have to wait for the convenience of an election. And the third and the most important is the popular initiative where the citizens can through the initiative process get their own pieces of legislation or constitutional amendments on the ballot. And this fits, and I'll finish with this, with the ethos of the West as the source of creativity. Not just Silicon Valley, although I'll certainly talk about that if somebody wants to talk about it, but that's certainly part of it. But it's also the creativity with respect to policy because we have seen the initiative process. It has its pluses and its minuses. But on the plus side is the fact that initiatives have given rise to things that would not normally or as quickly come out of the legislature. So I think there are really important reasons to study the 19th century. I'm very grateful for the people that do it. Uh, and I learn a lot about uh, the facts that are very important as I think about how it plays out in the, in the 20th and 21st century. So I'm so impressed and intimidated a little bit by all these people taking notes so feverishly um, and no one has yet asked if these are going to be on the final paper, <laughs> the final exam. Uh, but actually, let me go back to Ginji's opening remarks, Virginia's opening remarks, um, <laughs> about where she, I think it's actually quite fitting that she started her, she encapsulated 19th century American history, Western American history, using a cinematic device, a sort of time lapse, you know, quick cuts across the 19th century. Um, and I, you know, that sort of, for me, returns to my opening remarks at the first session of this, uh, or after uh, Dr. Koch's uh, remarks, the first session, the first uh, panel we had, where I talked about the code of the West and the code of the Western, uh, and how those were entwined in some ways, but how so much of what we understand comes out of Westerns. And then also in her opening remarks, she mentioned that both Bruce and I represent and live in California. Um, and actually, that raised an interesting question about California's relationship to the West and, and, and it brought a question about the value, something I also raised in my opening remarks about not the values in conflict issue, which was the title of the panel, but the value of history and the value of Western history in particular. Um, and I've thought about that in a number of different ways, especially over the last couple of days. Actually, let me ask a question. How many of you think of yourselves as Westerners? I'm, I'm surprised that more hands didn't go up here in some ways. What sort of on the other side of that is when I ask my students at the University of California, Los Angeles, almost 90% of whom are probably from the state of California, um, almost none of them see themselves as Westerners. Now that may be because many of you might also write California out of the West. Um, <laughs> It's, some have suggested the land of fruits and nuts and not for its agricultural <laughs> successes. Um, but I, I mean, I tend to think of California as the westest west, the west only more so, to, to invoke. And yet most of my students, 
don't think of themselves as Westerners. West is not a category that is particularly relevant to them. Um, you know, it'll come up after they, if you go through and sort of well press them on a number of things, they'll identify themselves by a number of other categories before they get to Westerner, if at all. The problem for me also has been, as uh, Jinji mentioned uh, in my biography, um, you know, for a long time I've split my appointment between the university world and the museums, uh, the Autry Museum, which I talked about a little bit in my opening panel too. And you know, one of the problems we face at the Autry Museum is who's gonna come? Who, you know, from, we get people from all over, but obviously we principally the Los Angeles area is where we're looking to draw people from. Who's going to come to a Western history museum in a world where the West or Western history may not matter in the way that it once did or does? Now, we heard yesterday um, about one vision about how Western history mattered or matters still. Um, Marnie, in her remarks at the last panel, talked about a vision of how Western history mattered a great deal that she sort of invoked Teddy Roosevelt and Frederick Jackson Turner, and the notion of both the West and the winning of the West is, in Roosevelt's terms, as something that was celebrated as the core of what America, what made America great. Um, and then, uh, in Frederick Jackson Turner's term, as she, she spoke about the frontier thesis, the idea that it was the settlement and successive settlement of frontiers that shaped the American character, that made Americans who they were, that nurtured, gave birth to, not just the referendum system in some way and the initiative system, but gave birth to American democracy, that, that made America exceptional. That as historians have abandoned that framework, the struggle is left, sort of, so why study Western history? What's, what's, what matters about Western history? What lessons can we learn from the 19th century American West that still matter, if not the old Turnerian or Rooseveltian kind of vision of what mattered. Um, and I think we struggle with that. Um, and certainly, in some ways, the disconnect between the academic vision of what makes Western history matter and the, I don't, I'm not sure what term I would use for the Wild West History Association's version. Popular version. Popular version, in some ways. Still, I think this conference really calls forward um, and really it raises a lot of interesting questions. I think um, they start with stories in some way that they tell and we have a lot to learn from telling stories. I think Dan Flora has brought that up very nicely. Um, because I think with academic history, we tend to start with questions and problems for which we seek answers rather than telling stories. And maybe we have to learn to be better storytellers in, in some way because there's obviously a profound disconnect. I mean, I used to try to explain, going back to the cinematic image and then I'll let you go. I used to try to explain to my students the way in which Westerns as a genre had shifted and the interpretations of Western history had shifted on, from a scholarly standpoint by sort of talking about the transition from John Wayne to Dances with Wolves. And that sort of worked for a while for me until I would look out at my students and realize that almost none of them had, any, had never seen a John Wayne movie which was disturbing enough. But what really made me feel old was they, hadn't had a, they had no clue what Dances with Wolves was either as, a, as an invocation. And it made me realize again, um, you know, what we have to, how do we sort of connect? Now, I have answers but I'll, of, of some ideas, but I don't so want to go too long. I want to think with, um, and, and, and I'm glad you brought up stories because I definitely wanted us to get there and think, of, and think together as a group about what kind of stories about the history that we now understand as a complicated and multilateral and multidirectional and, and really dynamic and, and um, fascinating and diverse, but difficult to know. And in Nad Blackhawk's term, largely unintelligible story. How do we tell those stories about our common past when we come at that common past from so many different places? And for me, that's, it's such a critical question. Bruce, when we talk about um, environmental issues and policies that undergird all of the other kinds of possibilities that we have, what kind of stories can we tell about uh, the, our common challenge despite our differences that will help us solve some of these problems? Uh, yeah, well, that's of course a really important point. And 
Unfortunately, political science gives a very dark answer to that. So uh, I was hoping we didn't get to it right early on, but okay. <laughs> so the dark answer that we tend to give, and it was actually mentioned earlier in one of the other panels, uh, I think it was talking about Native Americans and why Native Americans, it might have been Sheldon, I don't remember, but uh, this notion that the experience, oh no, it was Dan, it was the experience with climatic disaster. You're talking about the Pleistocene era, that's what it was. And that actually is, uh, so this notion is that unfortunately, Sometimes we only learn from our mistakes. And the mistakes have to be sufficiently grave for it really to make us uh, get rid of our habits and to overcome inertia and to do something different. Um, and what happens is when the memory of disaster fades, then we tend to go back to other uh, behaviors that we had before. And so, unless a disaster is sufficiently strong, the, our, our sort of present bias, our bias towards what it means for us in the, in the present, uh, tends to swamp considerations for what it means for future generations for our kids. And so that, I think, is the stories we uh, somehow, if we, could, if we could find better stories uh, of success, that's, that's good. I mean, we can show that people are adjusting with the climate, change, the climate change, the fires are going to be a huge issue. Uh, I'm pretty sure that what's happening in, in California and in Oregon and Washington right now and the smoke that you guys are inhaling uh, on bad days here, that is I going to open up what we call a window of opportunity. And I, I, from what I hear from the people who do these kind of models, the likelihood that we're going to have fires over more months and more smoke coming through and covering more areas means that it's not just a California problem, not just an Oregon problem, it's not just a Utah problem, it's gonna come all the way and maybe even all the way to New York. That, unfortunately, is the kind of story that gets people's attention because it's when you have to share in other people's misery that you begin to have a little more empathy about it. So I realize that's rather dark and, uh, and it's not just human nature, it's also the political system that kicks in because the political system tends to reward. We have, again, a literature that shows that politicians get rewarded for fixing things, not for preventing things because the benefits are in the future and the costs are in the present, okay? Benefits in the future, costs in the present, bad equation, <laughs> okay? For, and so that's, that's, those are the stories we need and maybe they'll come out of what's happening in, in terms of sea level rise in Houston and what's happening in terms of the fires. I'm not sure. So I think about, um, uh, you know, one thing that gave me just a little hope in that dark picture is that you mentioned that um, the strength of memory is a kind of um, at least a crucial, if not dispositive, factor in how we respond to these kinds of calamities and challenges. And that made me feel like, you know, there's going to be some employment for historians for some time. <laughs> so I'm very happy about that. Um, but, um, but I want to think, too, about, you know, the scale of these challenges, okay? So it's not just, this may be one reason, Steve, why our students don't think of themselves as Westerners, because they realize that the scale of things that face them is both intensely local and enormously uh, trans-regional, if not global. So the, the longer those smoke plumes get, um, the less likely people are to think in terms of a regional container. Or uh, the students that you have at UCLA are highly, highly likely to be, if not themselves immigrants, one or two generations removed from immigration to this country from somewhere else or be understood as immigrants because they're non-white students. Um, so, or as some, in some way, you know, non-something, non-normative. So they have other ways of understanding yeah. their identity and thinking too about solutions to problems. Mark's story about uh, mid-level dentistry in, a, in, in Alaska, I think we have to think about stories that are both on an enormous scale and then stories that are intensely local. And I would ask you, Steve, to respond to well, that. Well, so, you know, I actually want to pick up first on that why don't they identify themselves as Westerners question. And part of it may be what you said. I think that it's not the category. They weren't, as yesterday came up yesterday in the they weren't raised on Westerns. John Wayne is an iconic figure. Their personal backgrounds aren't 
necessarily uh, deeply rooted in the western part of North America, going back for generations. It may also be because, in some ways, they think of the West as something that is out there and back then, um, that the West is a place that you have to go east from California to find, um, <laughs> and that it's also something lost back in the 19th, shrouded in some 19th century frontier past. And so that there's that divorce, too. But I mean, I actually, I'm struck by Bruce's line about do we only learn from our mistakes, which gets me back to the question on the value of history, too. Um, you know, going back again to the Turner thesis or to Roosevelt's view or to, I think, what we heard yesterday, there was a sense, and this is in the, the, the write-up for this conference, I believe the word celebrate uh, was there, that we were here in part to celebrate a history um, uh, and to sort of re re to, to look at the 19th century and to celebrate that history. And that's certainly, in some sense, the Theodore Roosevelt version of it. And to some extent, certainly the frontier thesis celebrates that history, even as it laments the passing of the frontier era uh, at the end. Uh, take that <laughs> well, but I don't. I don't have a. I, I think it's an intriguing word to think with. You know, what is what? What purpose does history serve? Are we here to celebrate it, or in you know the critique of academic historians is, is that we've turned it into too dark a story. Uh, and it's become a sort of denigration rather than celebration. Evidently, we got nothing on political scientists, so they're, you know they're, you got they're darker still. <laughs> yes, but we are dark. You know, it, it does. It does. You know, again, get to the larger kind of quandary: of what is the purpose of knowing history? Um, is it to celebrate the heroes of the past? Uh, is it to, or is it the reverse of that? Or can we only learn from our mistakes? Is history, and Western history in particular, simply a sort of story of wrongdoings, a march of folly, um, from which we maybe can do better in the future because we try, learn not to repeat those mistakes. I'm skeptical about that, that, that framework of history repeating itself. I love the quote yesterday. So I can't remember who brought up Mark Twain's quote, that history doesn't repeat itself. Eric, thank you. History doesn't repeat it itself, but it rhymes. You know, what, what are the rhymes that we can find, though, in our 19th century past that do allow us to go back to the questions that you raised earlier? that might allow us to live more sustainably. And going back to the project that I'm intrigued with or working on, that might allow us to live together uh, more harmoniously. So I really want to pick up diversity. on that um, in, in, in a very deliberate way, because I want to think about this question of how we celebrate heroes. And one thing I've been struck by um, through all of the conversations and all of the stories that we've told over the last three days is that somebody who is a hero to one person is by no means a hero to another. Mm. And this is where the concept of celebration becomes incredibly complicated. So on the one hand, we can say, you know, John Sutter, um, we're sitting there listening to Roger McGrath, you know, tell us about this extraordinary discovery of gold in the, in the mill race at Sutter's Mill uh, in what is now Sacramento, California. And, and for a long time, that was told as a historic story. And Steve's colleague, Ben Madley, would tell you that this is by no means a historic story. This is the opening to an extraordinary genocidal tragedy. Or the way so, Kit Carson was talked about by Hampton. You know, and, yeah. Exactly. You know, so we have these heroes are not uncomplicated. They are not heroes to everybody. They can be celebrated in one minute and then absolutely deplored in the next. And it is not for bad reasons that this happens. So I, this, if we wanted to have a conversation about whether we can all get along, whether there can be abundance for anyone when there is scarcity for everyone, I think that creates stories that we've, we've got to find a way to be able to communicate across differences where some people actually do lose out when others win. How do we tell those stories in a way that, that brings us together for, with our common humanity? Can I give a political science take on this? Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it'll be and cheerful, it is, right? <laughs> no, actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's my role. I'm yeah. the dark, dark lord of political science. <laughs> no, I think, I think there's a serious question that comes uh, as a result of uh, both good history and good investigative journalism, which is how do we govern without myth? How do we govern without myth? Because... Being an old guy, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and there was 
you know, uh, myth that I kind of knew that was myth about George Washington and cutting down apple trees and never lying. I never believed that for a second. But, you know, there was a lot of myth that I think went around, went with leaders, uh, with, um, with, let's say, the presidency. And we've seen over time that the very cozy relationship that uh, the Washington Press Corps had with the president uh, broke down with the era of TV and broke down even further with the era of cable TV and has broke down even further with the era of social media. And so you have two problems here. One is the stripping away of a kind of mystical belief in the leader that was maybe at its height when we had monarchs and, you know, and the president was kind of had a little bit of that symbolism that the person is supposed to be the symbol of the country and believing that that person was better than us, us normal citizens, was part of, of why we obey the rules and why we're willing to go along. And now that we know that, that, that there are only human beings in the presidency, then even the people that we most revere had, as you guys have uncovered for us, <laughs> lots of flaws. How do we govern knowing the fallibility of the people that are in office? And I think it's a, it's a tough question. It's not just in, in this, because there are some people that really want to believe in you know, uh, a powerful daddy or a powerful leader that is more, at least less fallible than the rest of us. And that's not the case most of the time. So. I scribbled quickly because this interesting question about do we want to govern without myths? Do we want to live without myths? Um, I suppose if we see myths as being um, defined as falsehoods, uh, things as we learned yesterday that, you know, the, the, as the Wild West Associ History Association people were talking about, things that you wanted to sort of be able to either prove were true or prove that, or show that they were not authentic. Uh, yes, it's good to, to, to debunk uh, those myths in terms of debunking falsehoods or debunking alternative facts. Um, <laughs> but I don't know that we want to live without myths insofar as myths if we understand myths as the stories we tell about ourselves to explain how our world got to be the way it is. Uh, and in that sense, Western history you know, is filled with myths that you know, it's important to show which are true and which are not, but I think they're also powerful in terms of the ways in which they explain, to our, explain our world to us in ways that help us understand our world. So I guess I'd be careful about simply dismissing myths, though but, I'd be but, obviously in, in redefining it somewhat. But I think Virginia's point, and you can tell me if I'm misinterpreting you, is what happens when there are multiple myths? Mm. Uh, you know, the how do we reconcile the different myths that people have? And that's presumably what you try to do as much as possible. But how do you then create a kind of common understanding out of all that. And I think that's a real challenge, particularly now when we add in the social media, because then we're getting all kinds of myths created by all kinds of people, including the Russians, apparently, <laughs> so, <laughs> and the bots and various other things. You know, uh, it, it, there is a serious challenge here. And I think it happens every time we have a transition in the way we communicate. Mm -hmm. I think we had it with radio. I think we had it with TV. We had it with cable. Uh, social media, though, I think is the most substantial shift in the way we communicate uh, of all the shifts that have come to date. And I, I don't know how we get out of that any kind of common understanding because what we do is we silo, and you see it with the kids in college, they're siloing into certain groups and they don't get exposed. And, you know, and again, I'm going to sound like an old guy, and I am an old guy. We did have three radio, uh, three TV stations. When you explain this to the students, <laughs> and you explain that you had to beat your brother or sister to the dial to change it, that you didn't sit there and click things, they go, really? Uh, but the point is that there was a, more of a common source of information and knowledge. That's gone. We're never getting it back. We're going to be, uh, you're able, if you want, you're going to be a super citizen like me and constantly read about politics. Or you can be a citizen slacker and not read anything, but simply you know, follow wrestling or whatever it is that's your interest. How do you create any kind of common civic uh, 
culture out of that. We well, and that, that, I mean, that <laughs> is now the question that, uh, that I'm really trying to, to dig into as much as possible here because I think, you know, Steve, uh, your mention of alternative facts, I think what we have to do is um, reject, you know, as a historian, I categorically reject the idea of alternative facts. But what I do uh, accept is the idea that um, facts are always selected to prove a point. And so if you're telling one kind of story about um, a, a heroic actor that is, you know, that you happen to admire and idolize for whatever reasons, that probably have something to do with self-interest and, and wanting to see your own reflection uh, in the historical mirror, then you pick a certain set of facts. But if you are a person who comes at that story from a different direction, you're gonna be able to tell your story using things that did happen in that same historical context, but in a different order and probably selecting different things. So how do we tell a story that will give us at least a common language, if not a common culture? I mean, I don't think, I don't think we're gonna get to that, and I'm not sure that I want that. I don't want that. I don't want everybody to be like me and some you know, boring suburban housewife who also you know, writes books that, about things that are true and then makes up stuff that didn't happen. You know? I, uh, I, you know, I don't think that that would be a very interesting world to live in. So uh, maybe this is a challenge that uh, we can uh, open up a little bit. Well, I mean, look, again, now we're really going to the biggest questions about writing history and thinking about history and, and what our obligation, obligations are as historians to try to, obviously, we, there are selections that we make and the records, the archives, also limit what, what, you, what you can find in some cases. But I think we have the obligation to try, as historians of the American West, to try to tell the story from as inclusive and broad a point of views as possible, to bring as many different stories together, let them collide in the ways that they need to. Um, uh, it, it's a real challenge. I, well, we should open it up because I want people to talk yeah. because I want to hear from everyone here about it. But um, I don't think we can abdicate the ground and sort of say, look, I think one of the problems I have with students oftentimes is they often, maybe it's age or something, but they often want to see people in the past as just like us, only with less good technology. <laughs> um, and whereas I think good history begins, especially good deep history, begins with a more fundamental recognition about the different worlds in which people lived. The other day, I can't remember who invoked the idea of presentism. Um, that was Hampton. That was Hampton, yeah. okay. So he talked about you know, presentism. I often draw the distinction between, historians are always present-minded. We always have to, we're always asking questions about the past filtering it through present day concerns and understandings. But I think there's a real important di difference between being present minded in how we approach the past and being excessively presentist, where we impose entirely the value and the world that we live in on the past and we don't do justice to the very different sort of worlds in which people in the 19th century lived and, and sort of trying to understand in some sense the world as they inhabit it, understand it. The, uh, another cliche that, I don't know if it came up at this conference, but you know, the idea of the past, right? Do we, we did hear the past is never past, or that, the Faulkner line, but I don't think we got the past as a foreign country thrown out yet. But I think that's a crucial way to think also, to remember the 19th century American Western history is not just, is, they're not just like us. There are, obviously there are important ways in which they are, but the people then, lived in very different worlds, and we have to be careful to understand those differences. Okay, well, I think we really do need to open it up and, and, uh, and start hearing from people, so let's get the mics up and get them around. And I'm gonna ask you all to please, if you can, uh, be concise in your questions. We aren't always as concise as we'd like to be, but I'd like to hear from as many people in the time remaining to us as, uh, as possible. So I see Sarah way back there. This was a really great uh, concluding panel. So here's my question to you. Steve, you were joking that there's not going to be a test. Everybody's happy. <laughs> but, but what would you say people, if you could say, here's what I hope people take away from this and think about as they leave the conference. 
you know, what's it all about, Alfie? I mean, what, what would your sort of prescription, both of, both of you? So what I'd like to do is postpone the answer, postpone asking them to answer that question because I want to hear, I think we need to get there. I think that we're, and in fact, I'm actually going to take the opportunity to say what I, th what I hope people will do as well. But I, I want to wait and hear some more kind of uh, maybe less ambitious questions. Who I said mean. there wasn't a final paper, by the way? <laughs> there, there's no lunch until people turn in there. Everybody has to make a two-minute YouTube video, <laughs> lightning rounds. Mark. So your class where no one said they were Westerners? One thing I've been wondering a lot is about population differences in the West. And with 11 million people in Southern California, well, in LA County, and that's bigger than any Western state, do they need the West? <laughs> Does California need the West? Well, I do think that, and somebody used the term earlier, that we really haven't unpacked the notion of what it is to be in the West. And there are a lot of different definitions. Uh, the hundredth meridian, which I think Sarah mentioned, was John Wesley Powell's definition of the West, is the one we use at the Lane Center. But I sometimes think, why didn't we use the Continental Divide, or why didn't we do it in terms of topology? <laughs> there were a lot of ways. The Mississippi or, River. Yeah, yeah, or you know. So obviously, the one thing that I think is important to realize is that in some very critical ways, the West is distinctive. And, and that maybe is part of what creates the common story, is that there are distinctive challenges in the West because we're living in an, basically an area that's very hard to sustain without an enormous amount of work and engineer, engineering. And that we have a culture of creativity which has transformed the world, as, uh, as we've seen, because basically high tech is not simply in the Silicon Valley, it's in Austin, it's coming in Boise, it's going to be in different parts of Western state. But the West, I think at this particular moment in time is not just one entity, unfortunately. We have the extractive states and the mountain states with their very specific interests, and as Mark's talking about, with more power perhaps than a normal democracy would allocate to them. Uh, we're a very unusual democracy in that we give uh, electoral and Senate representation uh, in disproportionate amounts to the rural areas. So in some ways, it still is Jefferson's world. Yeah, in, in certain parts of the West. And then you've got the, the highly populated, underrepresented, uh, high-tech West. But you know they have a lot of money resources, right? So the question is, and this, this becomes a problem when you collaborate on energy and water, right? And Sarah was talking about it with the Colorado River. You know, what's, how, does California get to dictate what the growth rate is of uh, Las Vegas or other, uh, other uh, cities that are using that water? And then it comes to the energy. I mean, it's very clear as we look forward that uh, we have to, you know, provide the energy. We're increasingly um, in need of electricity. Everything that, uh, all the computers and phones that we all use mean that we have to develop our energy resources. The sensible way to do that would be, and, if to, and to have a green economy, is to have the extractive states that are living in the plain areas, which has the most amount of wind, to do more wind resources and to transfer that over to California. But you know that's really hard to do because the transmission lines are hard to build. People don't want to have transmission lines. So there's got to be, you know, and Mexico could be part of this too, but how we, how we get over the many West problem which is both formal in terms of different fractured states and, in, and culturally in terms of the, the divide between extractive and green economy and various, and, and, and the, the arrogance of California and, and, and the East Coast in terms of how they treat the interior of the country. So, so that, let me, let you know, me. that, I'm just gonna say, <laughs> yeah. stick, kind of stick a quick pin in this because I do wanna note that when you, that the first thing you did was try to tr uh, solve a problem of borders. Here, And so I think that as we think about the long span of history that we've been thinking about, even going back to, thank you, the Pleistocene, uh, you know, how we think about borders and the fact that resources and people are always going to be transgressing those borders right. and how we understand ourselves as both includers and excluders of right. things is something I want us to think so, with. So, you know, again, Mark, your question, do they need the West? Do we need the West? is a version of Sarah's question in some sense, is what's the takeaway from this too. Um, now, I should say the presidential address I gave at the, President, at the Western History Association last year, 
I entitled The We in West, uh, by which I am trying to suggest that, yes, we need the West, that you can't, well, this is a pathetic line, but you can't spell West without we, um, <laughs> but. Oh, Steve. He's never above this sort of thing, yeah, I have to I know. tell you. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to undermine me, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> but I, actually, okay, I'll wait and postpone my answer until we have more questions that will give us a more clever answer to give. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, uh, please. Sorry, we're, you guys, we're putting you on the run, but uh, it's a, we're, we have everybody here, which is wonderful. Uh, we, uh, you've spoken a lot. Uh, and so have all the other panelists about myths versus reality about the West. I'm just wondering, can we formulate the concept of myths as part of scientific inquiry, meaning they are hypotheses until further research is done? I think, can we speak, have the data scientist actually, <laughs> you know, give us a start? Uh, I think it's a good point. I mean, ideology, uh, is uh, believing something regardless of the facts, but having some set of beliefs about how society should be organized. Um, religion is also having a set of beliefs that are not necessarily falsified. I think what historians do is take the scientific method uh, of evidence and try to apply it to widespread beliefs. And I, I think we have to get back to that. We have to insist on that. We have to insist on that in our journalism. We have to insist on that in our, uh, in our historical studies, because otherwise, uh, if we don't have a factual basis on which to work, we're in deep trouble. Uh, because we, we have some substantial challenges facing us in terms of the West. We're in an unsustainable, uh, what would be naturally an unsustainable environment for the population levels that we have, for the energy demands that we require, for the water that we need, uh, you know, for the air that we breathe, we're in a kind of potentially unsustainable situation, and we've got to think our way out of that, and it doesn't do any good to disregard evidence. So yes, I think we have to take myth and subject it to evidence. Yes, please. And I'm sorry I, I haven't learned everybody's name over these three days. I wish I had. It's Mel. Um, <laughs> Hi, Mel. The, the, <laughs> the question is, uh, obviously, the West Coast and California have evolved and become different than the rest of the West. Uh, in the interior of the West, uh, you know, uh, Montana, Wyoming, as compared to California or Oregon, is obviously a different place. And uh, California has evolved into a, a state that is, you know, kind of avant-garde with regard to the rest of the nation. Uh, I'm not. I'd like to know why you think that happened and why we can't hope that that will kind of transfer to the rest of the country, uh, including the West, the rest of the West. And uh, obviously, you know, our current state and more recent state of federal government is sort of controlled by interests that are different than the interests that are controlling the California government. And so I guess the question really boils down to what is it that does happen in California that is different and why did that happen? So, Steve, do you want to start out with that? And well, so, you know, one thing would be to take a historical perspective on it. And, you know, yes, I think we think of now California not just as the westest west. Well, it's not really the westest west. Hawaii, Hawaii and thank whatever, you. yeah. yeah. <laughs> they are a state, actually. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Alaska, you know. West, no, we, um, may, we may eventually drift out toward that direction. <laughs> but... Um, you know, how did California become so blue would be the other way your question might be asked. But again, you know, let's be, rem let's be reminded that it wasn't always so. And in fact, it wasn't always so quite recently. You know, the idea of California as the, I mean, yes, there has long been a, a sort of a, a myth attached to California, a, a belief attached to California as a promised land, as a land of new beginnings, as a land in which people could sort of reinvent themselves and change the world. And what state, what, to borrow from the conference title for the Western History Association next year, uh, or the year after this one, what starts in, what happens in California doesn't stay in California, um, would be a way to frame it too. That California has long exported itself. Again, not least through the movie industry exporting uh, itself. Um, 
but again, a historical perspective would remind us that California X years ago was the birthplace of the modern conservative movement, um, was the birthplace of the new right, uh, was Reagan country, was Nixon country, was Reagan country, was in recently as 1994, a place where Pete Wilson could run a campaign with various kinds of Trumpian uh, tones to it in terms of the politics of immigration and win. Now, obviously, a lot has changed culturally, and a lot has changed demographically uh, that one could say, is the rest of the West following that pattern? And what does that suggest in terms of the future of the West and, and its politics? Let's hear from Bruce. Okay, good lead in. And I think that's, that's really, answer number one is demographic. And that divides into two parts. One of it is the um, increasingly non-white uh, populations in California, particularly the Latinization of California, partly uh, due to immigration uh, and uh, both undocumented and documented. Uh, part of it is the migration of uh, white collar workers uh, into um, places that have high tech opportunities or new economy opportunities. And uh, that is happening, both of these trends, these demographic trends, you can see throughout the West. And it's why some of these states have become more competitive. Uh, it's certainly happening in Colorado. It's right. happening uh, in uh, Montana. Uh, I, you can see with Boise um, that uh, that's becoming increasingly a, uh, a center that is attracting uh, educated white voters. Uh, so. Uh, and then if you go down to Austin, God, I mean, Austin in the last 20 years has just transformed itself uh, almost unrecognizably by the growth of the new economy there. So if you look at the, one of these maps at the end uh, of what happens in a presidential election or whatever, and you see red and blue states, don't go to that map. Go to the one that breaks it down by counties, right. or even better, right. go, at, go back down into the precinct level. Right. And what you'll see is that even in California, with the image of California being, and this is really right. what Steve was getting yeah. at, this image of California as being this kind of very progressive San Francisco everywhere, no, <laughs> okay? Uh, there is a tremendous east-west division between uh, the uh, coastal areas and uh, the uh, interior areas, and including among the Republicans. The Republicans, uh, the joke we make is the Republicans who would see the water vote very differently from the ones that are you know, looking at the trees, <laughs> okay? You just have a very different, um, perspective. So, you know, I, I do think that that plus uh, the economy, I mean, if the economy, the, the, the demographic change, which is going to continue, no matter what the immigration policies are, uh, because of the differential birth rates, you're going to see a growth in the Latino population. And I, I believe the migration of, uh, of workers, though, I think it would be a good thing if uh, more people moved out of the Silicon Valley Got out, so that we don't have as much traffic and it isn't quite so expensive. And they start moving into these wonderful cities throughout all the West. Albuquerque comes to mind. <laughs> there you go. And we are a very, very friendly place. Yeah. Uh, where's the mic? Right here. Oh, for the, okay. Yes. Sorry. We're so fascinating. <laughs> Nobody wants to get up. Um, I had a question about populism uh, in the Old West and the New West. And uh, do you think it's a reaction to the increasing penetration and in, into those jurisdictions of the rule of law? Uh, uh, say, say the last part of it uh, again. And, and it, the increasing penetration of the rule of law into places where. Oh, yes. Yeah. OK, so uh, this gets to a point that I sort of only briefly discussed, but I think is really critical, which is that we are distinctive in the West because the federal government, as Sarah pointed out, owns so much of the land and always has right from the start because of the way it was acquired, et cetera. And then we, it, it changed its mission over time so that it would begin balancing the BLM type of mission with the parks mission. And then all the regulations that come in and the permitting comes in. And so every time we pass an environmental law, we get a different agency with a different mission. And each mission, you have to, you have to ping pong across all these different agencies in order to manage anything. And the agencies themselves have different missions. And so you, you can go to one, mission, one agency and get one answer and then go to another and get a different answer. So there's no question that the federal presence 
in the United States. If you look at the map, if you Google the map of uh, st you know, federal lands in the state, you get this wonderful map that David Kennedy shows at the beginning of every class that we do, uh, which reminds people that that's not true in the East Coast. And so these issues of how you manage federal, state, and tribal relations, because tribes in some ways are very powerful actors. They have fishing rights and water rights that can be enormously powerful political levers. And you add to that that some of the tribes are very wealthy, but not their minority. So you take that complexity of what we're talking about when we try to do these collaborative arrangements where we have federal, state, tribal, local stakeholders, and we're trying to get on the same page about what we're gonna do about land and water, you know, it's, it's gonna be a tough process. And so, yeah, that's the populism comes out of a frustration with, wait a minute, you know, the federal government is telling us what to do. I don't think that's completely accurate because I think that through the NEPA laws and other laws, there's been a real attempt to try to bring in stakeholders and there are lots of good examples of attempts to sort of listen more carefully. But this whole question of who owns which lands is absolutely a critical one. But again, this is a question of who owns which stories, I think, in part, because um, you know, Sarah's point was very well taken about you know, the, that this was federal land before it was state land. But before it was federal land, it was indigenous land. And I think we need to think about when we, where we begin our story. So when Mark says to us, you know, hey, gambling has a really long, long history, and we didn't think it was some kind of moral uh, weakness to, to engage in gambling, I think we need to really, you know, we, we need to reframe our stories in the same way that NEPA laws and other things have reframed who counts as a stakeholder. Who counts as an American? Who counts, uh, on what standing do they have? Do they have the privileges and immunities of citizenship or a right to, to hold a stake in a public discussion about whatever it is? And so from my point of view, I think you know, that the question about populism is, um, who are the people that are populizing? Okay, which people are embracing a notion of populism? I think it is often, um, a, a, even as it was in the 19th century, a nostalgic movement that seeks to restore an order where there are fewer stakeholders and fewer storytellers. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going out on a limb with that, but I'm gonna, I, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> All right. All right, right there, please, Joni. Thanks. Don't we just have to have a bigger lens so we have all these different paradigms, stories, myths, um, and that we're more comfortable with the ambiguity and the paradox, and we see it as a much richer tapestry of our history so that we can enjoy the contradiction. So yesterday when one guy says, you know, Billy the Kid was a sociopath. And the next guy says, no, I loved him. He only killed four people. <laughs> I mean, this is great. This is exciting. Um, when Bill Koch said, it's about perception versus reality. What's subjective? What's objective? Why can't, why don't we enjoy the many tools and the many stories? And, um, can we leave it at that and yeah. let's try and hear from yeah, some many just people? Yeah, not white just, thinking. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I, one question is, the we in West <laughs> oh my God. should be large, is <laughs> a, is a, is a large circle. It includes us all. Going back to my students, they're all Westerners. They live in the Western part of the United States. That makes them Westerners. It's an it's a inclusive definition. The question is, when you have the inclusive vision, how does it change the history? Does it just make for a larger canvas, or do you have a fundamentally different one? At the Autry, we use the uh, metaphor of convergence as a way of thinking about how the peoples and cultures of the West um, sort of were a weave in which the strands, you could still sort of identify the strands, but the weave sort of made for something that was sort of a much more interesting kind of picture, or in that case, an interesting history. Um, that would be one answer anyway, to go back to your tapestry metaphor. Terry. This is maybe just going back to Sarah's question earlier. Uh, 
I'm wondering what we've learned about how to resolve the many conflicting values that exist in both histor that exist today, partly because of of the 19th century, but also because of how wealthy we are, uh, how we use, how we communicate. Uh, I, I was taken back when uh, uh, Dan brought up the example of the American Prairie Reserve in, in an earlier session, and 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 it's this great example of what appears to be how could anybody be opposed to it? They want to bring back bison and so on. And yet, if you go to the communities where this group is, is trying to use markets, they try to buy the land, but there's a huge amount of federal land involved, and so they need to get some changes in the management of that federal land to achieve this American Serengeti. Uh, you go to those communities and say, what do you think of APR? And I can pull up an email from one of those people I got a couple of days ago. They're going to say... It's rotten. They're changing our way of life. And, and what I've thought this whole time is how, you know, in a sense, we look back at, at what, what the Indian history, and again, you know, here we were saying, uh, we want to change the way of life out here. What have we learned about how we can resolve those conflicting values? So I want to say something about that just from the point of view of how we narrate history. Is it a series of episodes of individuals who are defending their stake, whatever it might be? They can call it a way of life. Uh, they can call it a piece of ground that they're standing. There are going to be different metaphors for that. There are going to be different ways of understanding that. But is that the way, is that our kind of fundamental origin story of individuals in the Hobbesian world uh, where life is short, nasty, and brutish, and everybody is competing with everybody else? Or are we going to tell stories that are about the benefits of exchange? And I mean, maybe your story about the benefit of exchange is the more freely we can exchange things without impediments, the better off we will be. So that's a different way of, of understanding how humans frame their relationships. And I th I've thought about this. For years, I've taught classes about uh, food in American history. And we have had the benefit of some mighty good food, I will say, over the last three days. And it reflects a, um, a long set of exchanges and of goods and of ideas about how to use those goods that I think it, uh, has enriched all of us. And so to think in terms of, you know, of competition, but also to think in terms of collaboration or convergence or concord or exchange. And there are going to be winners and losers in many exchange, but not every exchange is a zero-sum game. So one thing would be, though, and this, Terry, I mean, I think we do have to speak to one another and not at one another or apart from one another. One of the things I really applaud about this conference is it's brought together a, a diversity of viewpoints. I kind of wish, and I realize it was somewhat outside the control of the organizers, that that we had had a conversation that sort of brought the Western History Association as it's been represented at this panel, at these various panels, and the Wild West History Association into common conversation with one another as opposed to sort of almost on the separate day. That that would be one way to sort of advance uh, the conversation, to, to sort of create a larger we in West in which we talk to one another. Um, look, one of my the quotes that I come back to is from a 1939 Federal Housing Agency report uh, for the neighborhood of Boyle Heights in East Los Angeles, which was then one of the most heterogeneous, diverse neighborhoods in, in the world, really, in terms of just the diversity of people living there. Um, and the federal agency basically comes in, and they decide to redline the district, meaning to make it unfit for federal loans, on the grounds of its being, quote, hopelessly heterogeneous hopelessly heterogeneous. It seems to me that poses the challenge for us. Um, is heterogeneous, is heterogeneity hopeless? Or can we get along? Is there a past and a future that gives us guidance to a more hopeful heterogeneity? Um, I think Western history, while it is filled with stories that suggest the hopelessness of heterogeneity, that suggest the conflicts, 
that 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 in, that, that, that will engage that, that have been engaged because of diversity. I think the Western history, Western history also gives us stories in which people do find ways to overcome their differences, um, to speak to people with whom they, and to have productive conversations with people with whom they had been fundamentally at odds. Now, many of those things fall apart. I don't want to sort of come back to a sort of kumbaya sort of story here in which everybody just sat along uh, the campfire singing together or something. That's not the history. But it does seem to me there are stories from the Western American past that do give us hope. And there are stories in the American present that do give us hope. For example, um, to go back to the rancher conflict and the environmental conflicts, I think of the Malpai Borderlands group in southern New Mexico, southern Arizona, along the Mexican border, a group of ranchers who were in the early 1990s seeing their way of life threatened, came together, not only with one another, but reached across sort of long-standing enmities to create an alliance with environmentalists, with scientists, with federal agencies, and in the process over the last now almost three decades, have both preserved the range and their way of life, which they saw as being threatened, and at the same time have sort of created, I think, a more sustainable sort of way of living. That's a model, it seems to me, that we can learn a lot from. That's a takeaway. So what do you think, Bruce? Um, well, I, I'm. I'm into your camp about collaboration, but I think it has broader implications. One of the interesting things is that if you look at the popularity of the Congress, it's down at about 17%. If you look at the faith of the US federal government, it's extremely low. And some of that is, the, and particularly in the West, is a, is a reflection of center periphery tensions which occur in every society. In every democratic society, the people that live further away from the capitals tend to be more suspicious of the centralized power of the capital. But I think it's deeper than that. I, I, I think that when you have a society as complex and diverse and complicated as American society is, we're going to have to be very careful about pushing things up to the most dysfunctional level of government, which is the federal government. And I think the question that Sarah and Dan might ask is, or at least maybe I'd ask that of them, is do we have to believe that the only trusted guardian of finding the balance between these different needs is the federal government? Or are we at the place, and I, all right, sounds like you're going to agree with me, that are we at a place where we can trust the states and regional areas to do more of the work themselves because they are in closer contact to the issues and they, I think the, the multiple values. I was impressed when uh, we take students on something called the sophomore college. We're going to Utah this year to actually look at Bears Ears and Staircase and talk about the park system. But one year we did a, um, a trip to Wyoming, uh, which is the energy state, uh, the state that has the most to lose from the change from uh, coal to uh, gas and other uh, green energy. Uh, and what I was impressed with when you went to see the strip, coal strip mining was the care that the Wyoming uh, state put into restoring the land afterwards mm -hmm. to the point of actually going out and finding the natural grasses and putting them in and then daring us and the students to sort of say which lands were never touched and which ones were restored. So I do think that we've made some mistakes, not just in the environment, but in a lot of different areas, and pushing a forced consensus on the country before we've actually done states as laboratories where we've actually tested out things and before we've had a natural consensus. And I just don't think that a very large uh, society, diverse society like uh, uh, ours can afford to do that. I think we have to make things work through uh, the more local and regional level. And then when we get, you know, obviously that can't be for everything. There are certain fundamental rights we can't do that with. But with a lot of everyday policy, I think we've got to be careful not to rush uh, and put it through the court system or through another system, but really try to work on the collaboration that you were talking mm -hmm. about and develop the stories that you're talking about, which then, like in science, in many cases in science, what you do is you start out with a test case or you start with a small sample and then generalize up. I just think we have to really see science and policy as more kind of an experiment in which we try different things 
and we see what it works and not be afraid of failure. I mean, there is a real culture of that, that. If you think of the private sector, why does the Silicon Valley succeed when, in fact, most of the time people are failing? Most of the time people are failing. Only one out of seven or one out of eight of these companies actually succeeds. We don't think of that as a loss of public revenue, but let's not forget that they're getting tax benefits mm -hmm. out of all this. So you're actually subsidizing this failure, but it doesn't send you to the same uh, you know, sense of outrage that you might have if the government incorporated uh, or, or the government actually invested directly in companies and, and, and succeeded in failing. So we think of tax money very differently, but we, in order to succeed, you have to fail. You have to fail. You have to learn from failure. And in our ethos of capitalism, that's embedded very deeply, but in our ethos of government, it's not. Why? <laughs> you know, why? So I think that, I mean, one conclusion that I would come to is that there are different scales at which stories are persuasive. Okay, so if we are telling an origin story within our tribal group, you know, that's a story that's very persuasive because we've lived with it our whole lives. We've heard it. It still matters to us. That story may or may not translate across uh, geographical or cultural borders. Some stories can scale up. And I think the language that we use and we think about what are the, you know, what are the commonalities that we can invoke that might help us um, translate our intra seemingly competitive interests into a common ground. Uh, that's, you know, to me, a really critical question. And I think about some work that I've been doing. You're talking about current uh, solutions. Some work that I have been doing at the University of New Mexico is involved with something that comes from our medical center and our people who are involved with public health. And they speak in a language that um, comes out of a, a phrase that um, started becoming current, I think, in the, in the early part of this century. They talk about social determinants of health. What are the various kinds of things that help us understand whether we're going to live longer and more desirable lives and have an understanding of abundance that is maybe not about having much but about wanting less? Um, how do we have these common terms about things that are in our common interest? Um, and this was a language that cut across disciplines in the university. It cut across. Um, uh, economic boundaries, it cut across public, uh, the sort of town gown kinds of things. So we began to um, develop very localized responses to some of these challenges to having healthy communities. And I think, you know, people want to be healthy. They want to live happy lives. They want to um, get what they want and maybe they should want less in a world that where abundance is, is mess, messing us up. So I think we have to develop language where we see those common interests and then find common solutions to them. I would ask the audience if you've got some, um, some closing comments for us, and, and we, we've got a couple more minutes before we have to wrap this thing up. I think the minutes are diminishing as we speak. So then let me quickly, <laughs> oh, let me quickly echo what Gingy said at the outset. First of all, um, to thank everyone at the Aspen Institute for, um, for putting this together. It's really, um, it's been an incredibly rich several days for me. I know it's made me think anew about the American West past, present, and future. Uh, and I do think, you know, as I said, it's a model, it seems to me, what we've done here about, I don't think we've come to, a, I'm, I'm, I'm eagerly looking forward to your final papers. <laughs> uh, O over cocktails and lunch, uh, but I also uh, I'm, I'm really I'm I'm so excited that that one could come together people with differing ideas, differing viewpoints, but that the Aspen Institute has really given us a chance to has brought us together, uh, and that it, that does give me hope about uh, our our possibilities.